My name is Betsy, and I am a master's student here at the University of Ottawa in political studies. Um, I'm also here speaking today as a working model in the fashion industry in Ottawa. I have an agency here, and I've worked with a few agencies over the past four years, mostly in Ottawa, Montreal, and Toronto. And at first glance, I, there's, there doesn't seem to be that much of a tremendous overlap between uh, my master's thesis and modeling, so working as a fashion model. Um, but over the years, I've learned to look at what I've been doing in modeling and sort of link it to my academic world. And I can honestly say that a lot of my interest in politics, in power relations, in gender, in women's issues, it has been really affected by working in the modeling industry and working as a model. So I'd like to share with you today a few anecdotes about working in the modeling industry, um, as well as my, my route in a way, you know, starting as a 17-year-old in the modeling industry, but also working at university. How I didn't, I used to think these two were mutually exclusive worlds. Some of my friends, when they found out that I was modeling, they would say, wow, you're double life, you know, because you, it, it does seem quite separate. Um, but after having talked to some very inspiring professors here at the University of Ottawa and doing a lot of you know, introspection as well, I have begun to see some definite links between these two worlds. So my aim today is to talk about just challenges and some stereotypes that I've overcome um, by being in the modeling industry. I've never actually spoken about it in front of a group of people like this. I've told some friends, but this is the first time that I'm doing this, and I'm really happy that I'll be able to share some of these anecdotes. Some are bizarre, some are funny, I guess some are kind of sad. Hopefully I'll get to all of them. Um, just um, probably your questions in your mind are, you know, how did you start out modeling? I never had an interest in modeling. When I was young, I was a big tomboy. I didn't care about modeling. The only thing that I knew is that I was always taller than everyone else. Um, my nickname in one year of school, uh, what was it? It was Overgrown Mushroom, because, uh, yeah, I know it's terrible, because I was taller than everyone. Um, my, so I have some family in China, and their nickname for me was, well, it's Sha Da Gur, which literally translates as like stupidly tall, like stupidly tall person, which is also, you know. So I knew growing up that I was always taller than everyone. Um, and I started model, well, I started actually in my high school musical, The Seussical. I was singing in The Seussical, and uh, someone who worked in the modeling industry approached me after that. So I was scouted after that, and I was 14, and I had absolutely no idea what modeling was about. There are lots of things that I've learned now over the past few years. I started working with an agency at age 17, so that means working professionally with an agency, and basically you, um, you are sent to castings by your agency. Your agent takes between 15 or 20 percent of your earnings if you book any jobs, and you are expected to treat it as a professional job. I never told my professors. I kind of didn't want them to know. I didn't really want my friends to know either. Um, but I started getting a bit more confused as I went through my university career. So I started taking more classes on politics. Um, I took my first course in you know, ethics and gender and started um, questioning the modeling industry because I actually started out kind of late, age 17. It's kind of old to be starting as a working model, especially if you want to make it into a career. And I never really wanted to leave academia. I liked being at school. And we would start talking about things like body image or you know, patriarchy, or all these ideas that I was thinking about while I was also modeling. And there came a point when, well, I don't know, I, I don't know how many of you have seen the movie Misrepresentation? All right, cool, quite a few. Um, I watched it and I, I got a little bit more confused after that, like it was a great movie, but I became more confused. So I talked to a well-respected professor here at the University of Ottawa, Constance Backhouse, and um, I told her about, you know, my insecurities about modeling and being in school, and she was very inspiring to me, and she told me, you know, as a woman, you can do a lot of things, and you can have a lot of, um, you know, different roles. You can, you know, you can still be a feminist and do all these things that you want to do. It's just, I encourage you to do what you want to do, and then make your own opinion about it. Don't let people influence you too much. So I've tried to stick with that. Um, one thing that's really stuck out strongly to me in modeling are the power relations in modeling. Uh, models are generally not, you know, that powerful. You are one of thousands of working models in this vast, you know, massive international industry. And there's so many different ways of looking at the modeling industry. 
Um, there are some stereotypes out there too. How many of you have seen Zoolander? Yeah, okay, a lot of people. Me too. It was pretty funny. Um, but those stereotypes are obviously stereotypes and not true. And uh, that, was par that contributed partially to my you know, initial sort of embarrassment about telling people that I worked as a model. Um, I've been sent to a variety of different kinds of castings and I've done a variety of different jobs. So some of them are runway jobs, some of them are photography jobs, um, some of them are a bit more, you know, you, you get paid to stand in a store for two hours, that sort of thing. Um, and my agency that I currently work with operates internationally. Now, as for some anecdotes that illustrate, you know, the power relations in modeling, these became clear to me when I I remember going to Montreal with a former agent of mine to meet another agent there. And uh, the goal was to sign me with that agency so that you know, everyone would make more money. And um, I remember sitting down and the two agents were just joking and chatting to each other. They're like, oh, we're glad you made it. And you brought the cargo. And they pointed at me like, the cargo, get it, like the thing. And I thought like, oh, that's so weird. Like what a strange way to think about myself, you know, like not as a person, but as the cargo. Okay, so the agent, you know, she whipped out her tape measure and she measured my hips and my waist, which is pretty standard. You do the measurements to see if you fit the clothing. Um, and then, you know, she looked at me a bit critically and was like, hmm, we, we'd like to have you. Maybe if you, if you should cut your hair, cut off about that much, and then we'll talk about a contract. And, I mean, it seems like a small thing, but I was really shocked that, you know, you, if you sign with a, some agencies, you essentially give up your you know, your control over your, your body to a certain degree. Like, they can decide what your hair looks like, what your face looks like. I met with another agency once, and they told me, like, they took photos of me, and they're like, oh, we like, you, you know, your face. Um, maybe you could consider getting plastic surgery to remove that mole in the middle of your face. I don't know if you guys can see this. I mean, it's a pretty small thing, too. But I was so shocked after that, and I began getting a bit more critical of the industry after that as well, because, you know, as a young woman, you can be very impressionable as a young person. So I would still like to come back, though, to three main points that I've learned through modeling, which I think are applicable to real life. Because I don't think it is quite that, I mean, it does have this sort of mysterious aura, this mystique about it, but I see modeling more as a creative endeavor. Um, oftentimes, if you're booked for a fashion show, and this is a great time for this TED Talk, actually, it's Fashion Week right now, if you're booked for a show, your job is to um, conform to a designer and a makeup artist's vision of what they want to see paraded down a runway. And it's exhilarating. I mean, you, you step out on the catwalk and it's, you know, your job is to conform to that creative vision. So there's a lot of creativity in the modeling industry and that's something that I really enjoy. But the three things that I've really learned, um, number one, it's pretty obvious, be proud of who you are, be proud of your height. So it all, you know, it depends which way you look at it. When I was growing up, I was always seen as, you know, too tall. And then suddenly, in modeling, it's not a bad thing to be tall. Um, number two, I think this is the most important one, it's important to stay true to yourself and to know your values, your personal values. It might not be a big deal for you to, you know, to cut your hair and you, but you know, your values are always being constantly challenged in modeling. Models are often, you know, supposed to be yes people. You want to, you want to be agreeable to work with. You want to say yes to things, but you can't compromise your own values. Um, and number three is something that's really applicable to all of life, is not to take rejection too seriously. So to effectively separate, you know, emotional attachment from rejection. So these are just a few, you know, things that I've learned and anecdotes that I've experience through modeling and I'm really glad that I've also been able to be in academia as well to get that perspective and to help develop my own interests in power relations and gender. So thank you.